This is the legendary Tom DeFalco, and you're listening to Amazing Spider Talk. Tell all your friends, because these guys are going to pay me a buck every time a new listener tunes in. Welcome to the Amazing Spider Talk. My name is Dan Gavazdan, and I'm the editor of SuperiorSpiderTalk.com. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Spider Talk and their amazing friends. I'm alone this time, but I hope you enjoy this podcast and the conversation between one fan, that's me, and a famous Spider-Man creator. For this episode, we'll be talking to the legendary Tom DeFalco. This is the second time that we've had Tom on the show, and we're excited to have him back to talk about his upcoming Spider-Man books and Marvel's 75th anniversary. Tom worked at Marvel Comics for over 20 years. During that time, he was one of the most popular writers of Amazing Spider-Man. Eventually, Tom became the editor-in-chief of Marvel for seven years, making him one of the longest-serving individuals to have that title. Tom also co-created Spider-Girl and wrote over 100 issues of the series, making it Marvel's longest-running female-led superhero title. I had a great time talking to Tom, but we had some slight audio problems that I only realized once I listened back to the show. I think the interview is still really great despite these issues, and as it is an extra episode, I figured that you all would still probably want to hear it anyway. So I hope you enjoy the show, and if this is the first time you're listening, know that I take sound quality as a matter of pride. So this is a rare example where the sound might not be perfect. Nevertheless, I hope you all enjoy my interview with the legendary Tom DeFalco. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Iceman and Firestar. Well, well, hi everybody. This is uh, Dan Gavazdan here uh, for Superior Spider Talk, and uh, I'm talking today with the legendary Tom DeFalco. So, uh, welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. Well, it's great to have you. So, uh, you know, we've talked to you before about the history of, like, your story with the Hobgoblin and all these other books that you've written. And today I'd like to kind of talk to you about um, your history with Marvel. But before we even get there, um, I wanted to ask you about your history with comics. You know, can you remember picking up your first comic? And, like, do you, do you remember, like, did you feel compelled by this thing? Or what was your history with comic books? You know, my, my history with comics, um, you know, goes back to the, uh, the daily and Sunday newspaper scripts. I, you know, we got these, you know, a couple of Sunday papers uh, every Sunday, and um, I was fascinated by the comics. Um, my favorites were things like, you know, The Phantom, you know, Mandrake the Magician, mm-hmm. you know, Dick Tracy. Um, you know, eventually I fell in love with Pogo. <laughs> and, and and I'm still in love with Pogo, um, you know, on stage by Leonard Starr and just, you know, I, I just love, you know, the comic medium. Um, my first comic book, um, I, I seem to remember that I was at some sort of family gathering and one of my cousins, I, you know, um, my cousin, John, uh, who lives in Boston, uh, was, he was older than I was. And, um, he said, I, I have something to show you. And he handed me e- either a Batman comic book or a detective comic book. You know, all I remember was, the, you know, the Batman, you know, logo at that time, yeah. you know, you know, it had Batman, you know, as part of the logo and stuff. And I remember reading this and going through it and it scared the heck out of me. <laughs> uh, you know, Batman just struck me as such a creepy character, and you know, um, I was kind of taken aback with that. But I, I you know, I, I was also, you know, kind of intrigued by the idea of the comics 
um, you know, in, in this handy little booklet. Yeah. Um, up until then, what I had done is, you know, I cut out newspaper strips and I put them together in my own book. So I'd been making comic books <laughs> myself for there a while. You go. And, and, um, and then I started to look around um, and discover that you could actually buy these things, comic books, you know, at the local store. And I, I don't know how old I was, seven, eight, nine, somewhere around there, maybe younger, maybe older. I must have been younger because, um, you know, because years later when I was at the ripe old age of 11, I was uh, starting to lose interest in comics. Um, you know, they just, they just weren't getting to me anymore. Uh, and then one day it was a wintry day. Uh, I went to the, to the store to, you know, just look at the comic book rack. And as I'm flipping around the rack, um, they used to have these big spinner racks. I, I noticed this thing called Fantastic Four. And they had the same character on both covers, the Human Torch. Uh, when I first saw the title Fantastic Four, I just assumed it meant four stories in the comic book. But you know, I, I, you know, I remember it was issues three and four, and I decided to pick those two comic books up, uh, went home, read them together, and my mind was blown, as they used to say in those days. Yeah. Um, you know, these were comic books unlike anything I had read before. And, you know, from that point on, I was a hardcore Marvel fan. So, so what was it about those particular comics that, like, drew you more than, uh, like, say, Batman or anything you'd read up to that point? Well, these were much more character-oriented, and the characters didn't always get along. They were squabbling, kind of like, you know, I grew up in a family of, uh, you know, seven kids. Um, and... Uh, you know, we were always squabbling. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it felt like home to me. Uh, you know, everybody was arguing. Everybody had their own point of view. Everybody had, had had their own situation going on, their own problems. And and they were also something that, that you know, really struck home to me is um, I used to have a problem. You know, I, I like Jimmy Olsen comics. But I, I didn't like Superman comics and, and, you know, especially Superman comics with Lois Lane. And that was because, you know, Lois Lane would suspect that Clark Kent was Superman. And then she'd, you know, go to extraordinary lengths to prove it. And then it would be proven to her beyond a shadow of a doubt that Clark Kent was not Superman. And next issue, she forgot about that and started all over again. <laughs> And I used to think, boy, she can't remember from issue to issue what, what happened. But in the Fantastic Four, issue three ended on kind of a cliffhanger. And issue four reflected that cliffhanger. And everything that had happened in issue three, the characters remembered, which was something I'd never seen before in comic books. I know it sounds like a silly thing now. Right. Because now everybody, you know, pays attention to what happened, you know, last issue. Or, or a lot of people do. You know, and still. sometimes the cliffhanger is the biggest part of the issue. Yeah. And, uh, you know, although, you know, some comic books these days, they have a big cliffhanger. There's a new, there's a villain standing on the last page. And the next issue, they don't refer to that villain, which kind of confuses me. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that's modern comics. Um. So, you, you don't happen to have those issues of Fantastic Four anymore, do you? Um, I recently sold them. Oh. You know, I, um, yeah, I, uh, you know, a boring story, but Hurricane Sandy kind of destroyed my basement oh, and all no. my, my old comics. And the comics that survived, I had to stack up in the garage. And... Um, the, the time came where winter was coming, so I had to clean the com comics out of the garage in order to fit the car in there. Um, so I had to sell a bunch of comics. There you go. The, the real story of comic storage. Yes, well, that's one of the problems that you, you face. Um, so how did you find your way to Marvel? You know, you, you fell in love with these particular comics. Was it 
did it become a dream in your head to go and work for Marvel? Or because uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you worked for DC before Marvel. Um, yeah, I worked for a bunch of companies before Marvel. I, when I was growing up, um, you know, there, there were two really good writers in comics, a Stanley and um, you know Bob Canninger over at DC, and. Um, pretty early on, I kind of realized that I wanted to be a writer, but it never occurred to me to write comics because I figured if you weren't Stan Lee and you weren't Bob Kaniger, there there really wasn't a place for you in the comics. So as I was growing up, I was thinking more along the lines of Edgar Rice Burroughs, Mm. you know, doing those kind of adventure stories and, and stuff. Um... You know, I, I, you know, as I, you know, got out of high school, got into college, you know, new writers had, a, you know, had shown up on the scene. Roy Thomas and Denny O'Neill and, um, you know, Mike Friedrich and, you know, so many other guys. I'm, you know, not remembering, you know, all of the names, but it still didn't occur to me that, you know, you could actually get a job in comics. Um, I, I don't know how how those guys did it. So I wasn't actually planning on it. I was thinking of maybe doing a comic strip um, and, and, and writing stories. I kind of thought I'd, you know, be a weekend, you know, more of a weekend writer, um, which is a lot different from a writer who has to work on the weekends. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, after I grad, you know, while I was at college, you know, I sold and I started to sell my writing for the first time. I sold some newspaper articles. I ended up working, you know, for a while on a newspaper, worked for a PR office and, you know, showed, sold a couple of short stories and blah, 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 blah. And then when I graduated, I was looking for a job. Um, and I thought, yeah, why don't I apply to some comic book companies? I figured, you know, I could work in the comic book industry until I could sell a comic strip. And I, um, you know, did the the worst thing possible. I, you know, wrote um, letters, you know, with a resume and and that sort of thing. A recent college graduate, you know, I had worked on a comic strip in in college and um, which was published, uh, you know, in the college newspaper. And I put some samples together and blah, blah, blah. And I sent this, you know, I sent out, you know, essentially a resume to all the different comic book companies and took, you know, to my delight, Archie Comics got back to me and, um, you know, invited me in for an interview and then eventually gave me a job in their uh, art department. Um, My first job was to open, you know, all the mail for Dear Betty and Veronica Mm. To see if there were any quarters inside <laughs> uh, for the Archie Club, um, you know, and then I did some proofreading and uh, you know, and continued to work for Archie Comics for I'm going to say seven years. Um, and th- that comic was wildly successful at the time, correct? Uh, what uh, Archie Comics? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Archie was doing terrific at that time, and. Um, you know, eventually started to sell some stories at Archie and um, eventually uh, started to, you know, cut back on the staff days and started to work there part time. I think I, you know, towards the end there, I was working there two days a week uh, on staff and, you know, the rest of the time at home. And um, while I was, you know, freelancing, I started to also freelance for Charlton Comics and did a you know, a bunch of titles for the Charl- Charlton Group, uh, Will- Willie and the Chopper Bunch and Flintstones and, you know, Flintstone Kids and Scooby-Doo and, you know, a whole bunch of titles for Charlton. And and then at some point, uh, yeah, I, you know, I guess I met Paul Levitz at, um, they used to have this thing called the Academy of Comic Book Arts and Sciences, a, uh, a guild you know, or an organization for comic book professionals. And they would invite us Archie guys there once a year when it came time to pay our dues. 
Uh, otherwise, they didn't invite us to the meetings. <laughs> uh, and um, I think I met Paul Levitz there. And eventually, uh, through Paul, I, I met Joe Orlando at D.C. and um, started to work with them on some commercial jobs and eventually started to do some freelance work for D.C. Um, and then, you know, from, I, I think, uh, you know, Paul had this weekly poker game and he invited me to the poker game where I met a bunch of, bunch of the guys, Len Wein, Mark Wolfman, uh, Jim Shooter, and a bunch of other people. And Jim Shooter, when I met Jim Shooter, I remember reading stories about Jim Shooter when I was, you know, younger. And I just assumed that he was the daughter, <laughs> excuse me, that he was the son of Jim Shooter, the writer. <laughs> I didn't realize it was the same Jim Shooter because he was so young. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually I, um, you know, uh, was invited to do some stuff for, for Marvel. And, um, you know, so I was freelancing for, you know, Marvel and DC and Charlton and Archie and, you know, I'm doing a bunch of non-comic book stuff and, um, uh, you know, at some point DC had the, um, I forget what they called it, but, um, they stopped publishing a lot of titles and, um, around that time Marvel offered me a couple of books. Uh, I think it was two, two titles or three, two or three titles. I don't remember at this stage and eventually offered me an exclusive contract, writing contract. And then, um, you know, it, at, at some point, you know, Shooter was reorganizing the uh, editorial department. Shooter had been made editorial in chief and uh, edit, editor in chief and was, had decided to reorganize the editorial department and asked me at one point if I'd like to come on staff. And at that stage, I hadn't had a full time job in, I don't know, five, six years. I only had a full time job maybe for four years out of college. Oh, and to I, be an artist, you know. And I said to I said to Jim, I, you know, I don't I don't know if I can, you know, I can do that, you know, full time job anymore. I'm so used to freelance, and I have you know other other stuff I'm doing, non comic book stuff that I, you know, still have to do. And uh, and he said, well, well, why don't you take it on a temporary basis? Why, why don't you take it for this? Let's say like six months, just until I can organize things. And I said, yeah, I, I, I could probably do it for six months. Jim Shooter was, had always been very good to me, so I, I really couldn't see letting him down. So I you know, took a job for what I thought was going to be about six months and ended up to be closer to 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and, and, you know, you know you, that, that's the long story. <laughs> well, oh, you know, oh. it, you, you have a, an amazing story like going from like, you know, this – freelancer all the way up to editor in chief eventually you know i can't i bet you couldn't even imagine that as a possibility uh not at all <laughs> well so okay. we're a spider-man podcast and so what i'm curious like you know you've worked on a lot of characters over time but i guess for the majority of it you've worked on spider-man related characters you know spider girl and all these people but like why do you think that you know, Spider-Man is the character that you've been associated with so much. Is it like a love of the character or just like a voice that you find comfortable? Um, <laughs> or neither. I, well, I, you know, I, I guess growing up, my, my two favorite characters were Spider-Man, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I don't even know if I can separate them. Spider-Man, Thor and Captain America. You know, I just look, you know, those three characters just always got to me. I, I think my very favorite was Captain America. Um, when I worked on staff with, with Shooter, I basically took the job. And um, as soon as I took the job, uh, you know, uh, people started to ask me, so what titles are you going to edit? And I said, yeah, I, I don't know. I. I, I, I forgot to ask. <laughs> um, and uh, at one point, Shooter said to me, well, what do you think is the worst title Marvel is doing? And I said, um, 
probably, you know, at that time, Ghost Rider. I said, it just, he said, why don't you like it? I said, I don't know. It's like, you know, the people who, who do it, it's like they've never been on a motorcycle and, you know, and you got this, you know, scary image and no one's really playing up that, you know, the horror of, of the thing. Um, and he said, oh, okay. So I thought, oh man, I'm going to probably get stuck with Ghost Rider and, and, and a bunch of the, you know, crummy titles. Um, and when I came in, he said to me, you know, he gave me, uh, he, he said, that, I'm going to give you the Spider-Man titles. And I said, the Spider-Man titles, don't you think you need somebody with a little bit more experience doing the Spider-Man titles? And Shooter said to me, why? It's just like Archie, except with superpowers. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, you know, he's kind of right. All right, let me let me go in there with that attitude. And I, um, you know, I thought, okay, let me see. I, I said, and, and Jim, if I feel I can't do it, you'll... You know, I can come to you and, and, and you'll take the titles away, right? He says, if, and he says, if I feel you can't do it, I'm going to come in and take the titles away. <laughs> um, and then the other three titles I had were, um, and, and I was the first editor, um, other than Stan, who had all the Spider-Man titles together. Yeah. Uh, up until then, they were separated. Um, and, and there were a lot more at that time. Well, there were there were just three: uh, uh, Amazing, uh, Peter pa Parker, Spectacular Spider-Man, and Marvel Team Up. Mm -hmm. So it's just those three. So I had those three titles plus um, Ghost Rider and Micronauts, and um, and What If. And um, you know, I started working on the Spider-Man titles and. You know, really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the people I was working with. I had uh, Roger Stern on Amazing, um, Mark DeMattis on Marvel Team Up, and uh, Bill Mantlo on Spectacular. I mean, with guys like that, how could you not love Spider-Man? Yeah, right. You know, and I had terrific artists on the books, and, and I, I just loved it. Um, and then, you know, uh, while we were on that stuff, we, we started to coordinate the titles for the first time and, you know, and just, you know, we, we were just having a ball and I think it, it showed. Um, and, um, you know, it, after a couple of years, Shooter came to me and said, uh, um, I need you to do something else for me. And I said, well, what's that? He says, well, we're, we're going to do a children's line and blah, blah, blah. And I'm, and I said, you want me to edit the children's line? Well, no, I think I'm going to get somebody else in. But uh, I'd, li I'd like you to supervise. I said, what do you mean, supervise an editor? He goes, yeah, yeah, we're going to, we'll probably give you another title. I said, well, what about the Spider-Man stuff? Oh, don't worry about that. And I said, I can still edit the Spider-Man titles. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, don't worry about that. And then they made me uh, executive editor, um, which... You know, at the time I agreed to it, I really didn't know what the job was. And eventually found out it was, you know, the, the second idiot, you know, in chief. <laughs> um, and um, and then also found out that, no, um, I, I was not going to be editing the Spider-Man titles. I was, you know, I had to give them up. And uh, I found out that Danny Fingeroth was going to be editing the titles. You know, I became the executive editor and um, and initially was kind of annoyed that I had to give up the Spider-Man titles and uh, and initially got even more annoyed when I found out it was mainly an administrative job. Um, and then I found out that Sid, they were bringing in this guy from Harvey to edit the, the children's titles, uh, Sid Jacobson, and... Um, and uh, you know, and I was supposed to supervise Sid Jacobson, who probably knew 10 times more than I did <laughs> easily, uh, you know, probably, uh, probably close to a hundred times more than I did. Um, Makes your I, job I, easy. I, oh man. I think I learned, you know, I used to love going in to talk to Sid because I'd walk out knowing so much more than I, than I did walking in. Great. 
Uh, it was it was just a you know working with Sid was just a fabulous experience. Um, but around that time, Roger Stern was offered the Avengers, and Roger had had a, a, you know a wonderful time. Um, you know, I'm going to say Roger had a wonderful time, you know, working with me. He probably thinks I'm, you know, a bum, but <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to put words in his mouth uh, that, uh, you know, R- Roger enjoyed, you know, the experience and he was offered the Avengers. So he decided to give up Spider-Man. And one day Danny Fingeroth walked into my office and said to me, um, Roger Stern is leaving Sp- Amazing Spider-Man. I need I need to get a replacement. Now, part of my job as executive editor was to keep track of all the freelancers um, and make suggestions if an editor ne- needed somebody for, for something. So I pulled my list o- o- you know, off the wall, and I started looking at the list, and I, and I started you know, throwing out names to Danny of people who I thought could do a good, good Spider-Man. And then I looked up, and he had this goofy expression on his face. And I said to him, why aren't you writing this stuff down? And Danny said to me, because I already know who I want to write the book. And I said to him, if you already know who you want to write the book, why are you wasting my time? (laughs) And And he started to laugh, and he said, because you're the one I want to write the book. And I said, I can't do Spider Man. Um, I, you know, I said to him, I'm never going to be able to catch that voice. Only an idiot is going to follow Roger Stern because Roger did such a great job. Whoever does it after him is going to look like a bum. And, you know, there's no way I could follow Roger. And, uh, Danny said, uh, well, I think you can do it. I think you know the character and I think I'm pretty sure you can do it. And I said, I don't know. I don't know, Danny. I'm, I'm not really confident. And he said, well, I tell you what, Roger, I think he had two plot, had done two plots where he didn't want to script them. He wanted to get on Avengers right away. He said, why don't you script these two issues? And if you, you know, and, and see how you can do. And I said, all right. But if I, you know, if I feel I can't do it on the first one, you know, I can quit, right? And he says, well, if I feel you can't do it on the first one, I'll fire you. Don't worry about it. (laughs) Always looking for that exit. Always looking for the exit because I had no confidence. So I had no confidence as an editor. I had no confidence as a writer. Now, one of those issues happened to be the issue where Spider-Man, you know, the the one issue was where Spider-Man leaves to join the Secret Wars. The, The second issue is where he comes back in the black costume. <clears throat> um, Great time to get on the book, but who knew? <laughs> <laughs> who knew? Um, and uh, you know, so I, you know, um, you know, I. Uh, that's how I started on Spider Man. So, like, why do you think that you've been? Like, I mean, you're asked to write him so often. Like, is it just an understanding of the voice or, you know, like, what, what is it that you think they keep wanting you to do it? And, you know, because is, is it a personal thing for you or like you just find it comfortable? Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know why anybody else asks me to do it. Um, you know, I, I guess after, you know, I guess during my run on, on Spider-Man, uh, you know, I, I gather now, <laughs> now years later, people look at that run and say, oh, I, I really enjoyed it. I really liked it. You know, at the time, they just told me how bad I was in comparison <laughs> to Roger Stern. <laughs> Tough competition. <laughs> yeah, well, Roger Stern, I think, I, I think after Stan, Roger did the best. Yeah. I'm very prejudiced. I, you know, I'm just a Roger Stern geek. Um so I think that, you know, uh, you know, people must have liked it. And, and you know, as, as years gone by, you know, people keep coming back to me and asking me to do more. Um, you know, I, I started Spider-Girl, you know, st- started Spider-Girl. I only intended to do one Spider-Girl story <laughs> because 
um, the title that I was assigned to was what if. So I had to come up with ideas for what if. And, you know, I had, you know, had in the back of my mind, you know, what, what if Peter Parker's, you know, daughter had lived and, you know, called Ron, Ron Friends, um, my uh, unindicted co co-conspirator, um, and said, hey, you want to do a story featuring a spider girl? And he goes, spider girl? Oh, man, can't we call her spider woman? I said to him, no, I don't want to use spider woman because that, that, you know, that has the stink, stink of death on it. They've already had like three or four spider women. Let's not do another <laughs> one. Let's, let's come out with something new, something different. We'll call our spider girl. So he goes, um, well, what's your idea? And then we started talking and, you know, and came up with the what if issue. I think it was, I'm terrible with numbers. What if 105, this, the first spider girl thing. And, um, and we had a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, as we were finishing it up, Rod said, hey, do you think we can ever do another another one? And I said, you know, who knows? Maybe maybe we can do another, you know, a sequel to this somewhere along the line. But but we were not planning to do a series. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, and uh, and as for other Spider-Man stuff, you know, I don't know why people ask me to do it. Um, you know, I, I know this is a, a website devoted to Spider-Man and everything else. Um, but you know, I, you know, if, if I never had to write another Spider-Man story, I think my life could be complete. <laughs> uh, I don't have to do anymore. That's, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. I, you've done, you've done plenty. Yeah. I, if, if somebody asks me and it's, you know, and the, and the conditions are right, you know, I'd be happy to do it, but it's not like I'm walking around, you know, thinking about, you know, my next Spider-Man story. Stand a little straighter, walk a little prouder, be an innovator, laugh a little louder, go for the crater, we can show you how to, and when will you be then? You belong, you belong, you belong, you belong to the very Marvel Marching Society. This seemed like the perfect place to take a break in the show to remind you listeners about the Friendly Neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club. If you'd like to become a member of the Friendly Neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club and help support our show, please go to my site and click on the giant button that reads Friendly Neighborhood Spider Talk Members Club. Why did we name it that? You know, Marvel just turned 75 years old and, you know, like they're apt to do, they're putting on a big show about it. Um, and uh, so I wanted to ask you, you know, Marvel, 75 years old, what do you think their biggest contributions to the industry have been, you know, in the 75 years that they – like what is their legacy? You know, I I don't know about the legacy of – you know, of the entire company. I, you know, I look at, at Marvel and, and for the most part, I see the legacy of, excuse me, of Stan Lee and the Marvel age of comics. And I think what Stan brought was, you know, characters who act like people and have real people concerns and, you know, I used to love, you know, especially the Thor comic books where you'd have, you know, a 20 page fight scene, um, all action story. And as, you know, people are throwing trucks at each other and, you know, ripping up city blocks and all that other stuff. They're also speaking philosophy. Um, and I know that, you know, nowadays they say, oh, you know. It, it's unrealistic uh, for people to talk in the middle of a fight. And I'm thinking, yeah, you've never been in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I used to, you know, love that stuff. And I think that, you know, Stan brought 
a a real human perspective to comic books, which you know you know dominated the indus- industry for the sixties, the seventies, the eighties, into the nineties, and I think we're you know as time has gone gone on, we're kind of losing a lot of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you know these days it's more of a you know a TV aspect to it where you have people sitting around talking and you have headshots. If anything, you know, comic books are becoming more like radio, um, old radio dramas where it, it's more dependent on the dialogue than the visuals, you know, and I think comic books should be visuals and dialogue together, but you know, that, that could be old fashioned. What do you want? I'm, I'm an old fart. Do you, do you feel like that like uh, that early Marvel magic has moved elsewhere, or do you think the company still maintains some of that? I, I think the company maintains some of that, and certainly they have it in the movies. If you look at the the Marvel movies, they have you know all of the hoo ha that you know that you know Stan injected into the comics. Um, you know some. Marvel comics still have it. Some don't. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm curious, you know, you've worked with a lot of people while you're, we're working with Marvel. What are some of the greatest creative talents that you've ever had the opportunity to work for or work with uh, either in your creator writer phase or as your time as an editor or the editor in chief uh, of Marvel? That is, <laughs> I think it, I, I, yeah, that that is such a loaded question because, you know, I'm going to name, you know, a few dozen people and forget a, a couple of other dozen that I would go smack myself in the head for. So, so why don't we why don't we forget about that question and we just I, I could just say like you know do you have any like defining moments working with other people that, uh, during your time there at Marvel? Um. Well, you know, I, you know, probably, you know, one of my, you know, defining moments is when I started to work with Ron Friends. Um, you know, I, I forget when Ron and I started working together, and I have yet to discover when Ron and I are going to stop working together. <laughs> uh, uh, and and I am, you know, thrilled by that relationship. Um, I remember one time I did a plot for John Buscema. And I said to him, hey, John, did you like the story? And his reaction was, it ain't Shakespeare, but I think I can save it. <laughs> um, you know, I, I loved working with Herb Trippy. Um, I, you know, that Paul Ryan and, you know, well, yeah, I'm going to start getting getting into the names, you know, and writers, you know, Mark DeMattis and, you know, and I got to meet, you know, and, and, you know, work with, you know, Roy Thomas and, you know, Jerry Conway, you know, guys that, you know, kind of helped build this industry. Um, you know, I, you know, I, uh, you know, Barry Windsor Smith, you know, so many, you know, so many great people that, uh, you know, I just feel like a goofy name dropper. Okay, so let me let me ask you about uh, your tenure as uh, Marvel's editor in chief. Like, where do you feel like it falls into the greater history of uh, the company? You know, if if you had to speak about that, <laughs> the Forgotten Realms. Because <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think that uh, these days, you know, everybody forgets that I that I ever was you know Marvel editor in chief or anything. But you were one of the uh, longest lasting editors at, at Marvel's history, am I correct? Um, I, I think it was Stan, Shooter, Joe, and, and then me. Yeah. Or may, maybe Joe was longer than Shooter. I don't, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I, uh, yeah, but I, like, like these days, um, you know, these days I can't even get into most comic book conventions. <laughs> so that's why I say Forgotten Realms. Yeah, that's funny. I mean, so like, but personally to you, like, you know, are there achievements that you're very proud of during your, that you did during your time as editor in chief? Um, 
Well, you know, I, I, I was very happy with, um, you know, the Marvel masterworks, mm -hmm. you know, although, you know, at the time it was, you know, kind of a, a desperate move. Um, you know, I, I, you know, it's, the hassle is when I look back on my time as an editor in chief, I, um, you know, I, I remember more my failures <laughs> than I do my successes. Um, I mean, you, you presided over a, a pretty tumultuous time there, um, and, and had to make several like big stands for your, your staff, if I, if I'm correct. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. I just finished reading that Marvel history book and uh, reading about your time as editor. You know, it was like really fascinating to me. Yeah, I got to read that book someday. <laughs> <laughs> See how much of it is true. Yeah, I was, you know, the, the, the author is a great guy. He sent me a copy. Um, I, he's, you know, and, and I've heard very good things about the book, but, you know, part of me, said, you know, if you read this, you know, really, it, it, it's either going to, you know, uh, feed your ego and, and you know, uh, you know, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I need to have my ego fed or it's going to piss me off. Um, so I haven't gotten around to it yet. Yeah. I, you know, I'm actually planning on taking uh, my first vacation um, probably since the 90s. Uh, in, you know, towards the end of October, and, and I'm going to take it with me. Well, there you go. Oh, so. Uh, um, so let me ask you this then: um, Do you have any like favorite personal projects that you've worked on, like as a creator, and in, or in, in any capacity, like something that like speaks to you personally? Um. Well, you know, Eric Masterson. Um, you know, uh, he was kind of a synergy of, of me and Ron. So a lot of that was very personal. Mm. Um, a lot of spider girl was very personal. I, uh, based, you know, the character and her personality and a, a lot of her situation on uh, one of my nieces and, and her relationship with her father. Um, uh, who, you know, uh, is no longer with us. Uh, but, uh, hold on a second. So a lot of that was personal. Um, you know, a lot of the Spider-Man stuff was also very personal. Um, you know, I'm a weird kind of writer. I, I you know, I once said to the Mattis that I'm a one note writer. And, he, you know, he said, what do you mean a one note writer? And I said, I have to be, you know, all in a hundred percent. And he said to me, that's not what a one note writer is. Um, but, you know, I, I have to love my character and, and have to believe in the story in order for me to do it. And, and this doesn't matter whether or not it's a Spider-Man story or an Archie story, or whatever kind of story. Um, so, you know, to a certain extent, you know, they're, they're all personal to me. Um, do you have like a favorite, uh, like story in the history of Marvel? I know that's a lot to pull from, but one that, you know, if I, if I were to ask you that question, just jump straight to mind. Yeah, uh, but by other people? By anyone, yeah. Like, like uh, what is Marvel's this, standout tale to you? This man, this monster. Mm. It's a Fantastic Four issue. The uh, that's the one where the thing uh, becomes human again. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah. What about that one uh, stands out to you as being like such a strong work? Because it, you know, it's all about the. You know, it's all about, you know, who Ben Grimm is at his essence and and his relationship with the Fantastic Four. And it just, you know, clearly delineates all of these characters. 
And, you know, to me, that's what, you know, um, that's what writing is all about. You know, I think that um, when you, when you, you know, when I do a story, like I said, I have to put, you know, all of my passion into it. And my goal is kind of to reach out and, you know, touch the reader's heart. And if I succeed in doing that, you know, um, then, you know, to me, the story is priceless. And if I su- fail to do that, then the story is worthless. Um, and I, you know, and you touch the reader's heart in different ways. You know, an Archie story touches the reader's heart in a different way from, you know, a spider girl story does. Um, so, you know, it was recently announced that you would be coming back to work on this Marvel 75th anniversary like comic that's being released in a couple weeks. But there are very little details about like what that is and what your role in it is. Could you speak to us about like what the project is? The the project is a five page uh, Spider Man story. Is it five page or six page? I think it's five pages. Um, and um, yeah, I probably get in a lot of trouble telling you this, but I'm going to tell you anyway because it's between friends. <laughs> so so Tom Brevard calls me up, and he says they um, they want to do a, uh, a five page Archie story. Uh, excuse me, a five page. Spider-Man story in this, uh, you know, for this 75th celebration thing. And they want Stan Goldberg to draw it. And um, uh, because Stan had, uh, you know, colored a lot of the early uh, Marvel stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, Fantastic Four, the Hulk, Spider-Man, you know, all that, all of that stuff. And, 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 you know, and Tom said to me, he says, I know, you know, Stan. Um, and, you know, when I thought of Stan, I just thought of you right away. And I said to Tom, yeah, get out of here. You're calling me because I'm the only guy, you know, who can write a five page story. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, well, yeah, that's kind of true, too. So my job was to write, you know, and, and they said to me, we want to do an Archie style story. And I said, what do you mean an Archie style Spider-Man story? Well, we want to set it during his, his, his time in college. And, um, you know, uh, you know, have his, his friends around. So I said, okay, so, you know, here's what you get in five pages. You're going to get a real Spider-Man story with a beginning, middle and end. It'll feature Peter's friends. It has a super villain has a fight scene, actually has a couple of fight scenes, um, has a menace to the city, and it's all resolved in five pages. And, you know, it's a standalone story. Sounds great. So, sounds like <laughs> something that I've that's been sorely lacking in my life. Well, you know, you, 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 I'm sure people people will <laughs> look at it and say, Oh man, this thing should have been, you know, fifty pages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and and it's you know four to five panels a page. So you know, good old efficient Marvel style. Yeah, you know, storytelling, and and this is important. No matter what kind of storytelling you're doing, you know, it has to be efficient. You have to get in. You have to get out. You have to make your case, you know, introduce your characters, you know, establish your status quo, you know, establish the conflict, resolve the conflict. You know, you, you got to do that all with great efficiency. I think people forget that uh, Amazing Fantasy 15 was only 11 pages long. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, the strange thing is that, you know, television, movies, the, these things are speeding up. Things are moving a lot faster than ever before. You know, when you, when you do an hour television show, you know, w- with luck, you, you, you've got a script 44 pages long. You know, 
Sometimes it's cut down to 42 or 40. Um, and, and that's your entire shooting script. Um, you know, uh, you, you, you know, you, you gotta, you gotta tell your story and tell it efficient, you know, efficiently. Now TV has an advantage because you, you know, your, your in, intro credits, you know, tend to introduce the characters. Um, but you, you still got to, you know, move things along quickly. And, uh, you know, I always advise writers, tell your story. Don't tell people you're going to tell them a story. Tell them the story. Um, so, you know, we've got this big Spider-Verse story coming up in the pages of Amazing Spider-Man that features all of the different Spider-Man incarnations over the past 50 years. Um, and one of them in the next upcoming issues is Mayday Parker, Spider-Girl. And I was curious, you know, if there was any connection between you and Dan Slott about the characterization of, of Mayday. Um, Dan and I haven't spoken, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, I was just curious. Yeah. Um, you know, Marvel at one point asked me about you know, doing a 10 page Mayday story connected to this for something called Spider Verse Team Up or something. Mm -hmm. But um, I haven't, you know, heard from them since they asked me. And, uh, you know, at the time they're ready to work on it, I'll, I'll see whether or not I have time. Yeah. You know, that, you know, unfortunately, the life of a freelancer is, you know, is dictated by his calendar. So uh, it's you know it's 2014 and we live in a world where Peter Davis or not Peter Davis Peter David is now writing Spider-Man 2099 again and Rick Leonardi is back to provide art for a few issues. Would you? I mean, I, I you said you're you're done writing Spider-Man. I mean, not you're done, but you're you don't you're not like dying to do it. Is there any? Would you have any interest in returning to Mayday Parker with Ron to continue that series if the possibility arose? Oh yeah, if the possibility arose, I'd I'd jump at the chance to work with Ron on um you know on Spider Girl again. You know, uh, you know, you know, here's a secret thing that since I'm sure no editors are listening to this, I can say. Um uh, you know, you know, basically if you have Ron, you know, I'll, you know, I'm more than happy to come along for the ride, whatever the assignment is. Because uh, I just love working with Ron so much, um, you know, and I should never say that out loud because it always destroys my negotiating position. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we love Ron. He's been on the show like four or five times now, and you know, I can see exactly what you mean. Just the easiest guy to work with. He is a dream to work with, and you know, he and I have been, you know, have worked together, you know. For so many years, and we worked together so well, um, and um, you know, we both have the same attitude, which is the the story is the most important thing. And um, you know, I use this expression that Ron and I are idea factories. So sometimes I come up with a couple of ideas, and I, you know, mention them to Ron, and then Ron comes up with other ideas, and then I react to those ideas with other ideas, and blah 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 blah. And then by the time we're done. We have a story, but I can't separate the ideas, <laughs> and, and nor do I care whether or not we separate the ideas. I just think, hey, we have a story, you know. I'm thankful for that. It's just true collaboration. Yeah, because you know, uh, you know, in the creative field, there should be no ego. You know, the ego should be for the story, not for the. You know, not not for my ideas or that sort of stuff. Anytime I deal with the creative, you know, creative people who are jealous and protective of their ideas, I just want to smack them and you know send them into a corner, make them sit. <laughs> in a corner. Um. So th this week there was a, a a comic released where Gwen Stacy uh, took up the mantle of Spider-Man in this kind of alternate universe 
where she got bit by the spider instead. Uh, you know, this kind of spider girl concept seems to be this like eternal spring. And there's a lot of hype around this title becoming an ongoing series. So, you know, there have been a lot of, you know, other Spider-Man characters that have invented in their own universes. But what kind of advice would you give someone creating their own Spider-Man alternate universe tale that kept your series going for so long? Like, what what was the spice that made... Because, you know, as to this day, Spider-Girl is the longest-lasting female-led title in Marvel's history. Like, what... What do you think was the, the magic there? The female superhero, because yes. I think Millie, Millie the model and, uh, and um, oh, what was the other character? Uh, oh, there was another character that, that, that lasted, you know, you know, 200 issues or something like that. Um, anyway, uh, well, I would tell them to do what we did in Spider-Girl. Which is, you know, build an entire world, you know, around her, and, you know, give her a supporting cast, give her, you know, a status quo that you actually keep for a couple of years, um, you know, you know, again, build the world. You know, everybody talks about world building, um, but they. You know, nobody actually builds worlds anymore. Mm. They, they just, you know, bring in the character and then, you know, you know, three months into it, things will never be the same again because we're going to upset the apple cart. And two issues later, oh, we're going to upset the apple cart again. But you got to have time to stack the apples so that people realize, you know, that there are apples stacked in a cart before you can, you know. Upend it. Is this how you feel about like um, the events that Marvel does like every year? Um, well, to be honest, I haven't been paying attention to those events, so I don't have really have an opinion about them. Yeah, but I, I think <laughs> you ahead. know, I think it, it's very important to you know really establish a status quo before you can upset the status quo. You know, yeah. you, you have, you know, if you don't know what the world is and 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 the relationships, it's hard to upset that world and the relationships. You know, that's why, you know, if you have a television series, um, that's going to run. Let's say you get twenty two episodes. You know, you you spend, you know, the first. You know, 10 episodes, um, which, you know, would would be close to a year in a comic book, setting up the status quo. And you don't really upset the status quo until, you know, the final cliffhanger of the season. And and sometimes even then you don't upset the status quo. Um, And that would be the second year into, into the, you know, into a comic book. Mm-hmm. But the, these days, you know, by the fifth issue, you're upsetting the status quo. And, you know, you know, most of the time that isn't even, you know, one complete story anymore. So if you could finish the sentence for me, this will we'll end this uh, yeah. interview. Uh, finish the sentence for me. Marvel Comics is. Marvel Comics. <laughs> you know, Marvel Comics is. Hmm. You know, I don't know what Marvel Comics is anymore. I, you know, I'm not really up to date on what, what Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics is a mystery to me these days because <laughs> I'm not, not really up to date on Marvel Comics, and I'm not really paying all that much attention to Marvel Comics. Um, but Marvel Comics, you know, was the greatest roller coaster ride of my life. Great. Well, thanks, Tom, for joining us, and um, we hope to have you back again real soon. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Spider-Man and his amazing friends. Iceman and...
You can find all of our new Amazing Spider Talk and old Superior Spider Talk podcasts at SuperiorSpiderTalk.com or find us on iTunes and Stitcher by searching Amazing Spider Talk. And if you do, please make sure to leave a rating and comment to let us know what we're doing and we'll read it on the air. If you have any opinions on these comics or any questions, make sure to email them to us at AmazingSpiderTalk at gmail.com and we'll address and read them on the air. Also, be sure to check out both of our Facebook pages at Facebook.com slash SuperiorSpiderTalk and Facebook.com slash ChasingAmazing because they're great places to keep up with us in between shows as we often put up articles that we've written and other breaking news about the Spider-Man universe and how to get in touch with us. Don't forget to check out the Friendly Neighborhood SpiderTalk Members Club that helps us support the show. Of course, you can follow me, Dan Gavazdin, at at Dan Gavazdin on Twitter and my Spider-Man work at at sup spider talk and at superior spider talk.com. Now, before I go, I want to remind you all of the internal words of Mark Giannacchio with great podcasts must also come amazing spider talk. Man, it's weird to say that. Amazing friends.